Okay, good. Hello, everyone. I'm Chewy. Uh, as you can see here, I'm a developer advocate at Google, which means um, I advocate some of our developer technologies. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about search and some of the webmaster tools that we've got available. But before I start, how many people uh, own their own website? Wow, okay, good numbers. How many people work in SEO? A few less, okay, that's good. So you guys probably know more than me. Hopefully everyone else will learn a little bit of something. So um, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Understanding the basics of search, um, finding out how search works. We're gonna look at the webmaster guidelines, um, some top tips uh, for making sure that your website is crawled properly. Uh, we're going to look at some hot topics, things like Flash and paid links, and finally look at some of the resources that are available to you. Um, my very worst habit is speaking too fast. I get nervous in front of crowds and I speed up and up and up and up and up, and I realize that you're not an English audience. So if I speak too quickly, if I'm going too quickly for anyone, wave your hands in the air, throw something at me, please. I will slow down, okay? Just no bottles or phones. <laughs> okay, so Google's mission. Organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. What that means is we want to crawl content from everywhere, um, and we want to make it available to people no matter how they're searching. But in order for this to do this, we have to be able to understand your website. Um, here are some facts about uh, the Czech state of the web. Um, this one in particular, this isn't specific to the Czech Republic, but up to a quarter of the web is new every time we go crawling. And we crawl about once a month. We try to crawl the entire web. So that tells you that there's a huge amount of content coming out all the time. And one of our challenges is working out what content is the most useful. And that's something you can help us with. But first of all, let's have a look at how uh, search works. There are three main sections. The first is crawling. That's where we go out, we follow links, we try and find all the web pages on the internet. The second, we calculate, well, and actually these are the wrong way around, I apologize. The second is building the index. This is deciding what information is useful, what we should actually collect. So if we find duplicate copies of pages, for example, we only want to take one. And then the third is the page rank. So once we have all these pages, how do we calculate which should be first? Which should come at the top, which should come fifth, which should come second, and so on. So we're downloading, or trying to download, a copy of the web. And we're trying to understand non-HTML content. That's one of the uh, really tough challenges. And also deep content. So you think about a site like eBay that has billions and billions of pages. We want to be able to see all those pages and then make a decision on what's important to us. And that's really, that's, you know, really vital. We have to be able to decide that that auction about that really obscure little thing is actually more important than the 2,000 auctions for the similar car. Or maybe they're not. And then also controlling the speed of access to your web server. We don't want to take your web server down by sending too many requests, so we want to make sure that you can control that too. Page rank. So, when we've crawled everything, we've put in the index, how do we index it? This is kind of the magic source of Google, but it actually, it's really, really simple. It comes down to one pretty simple idea, and it's the idea that each link uh, to your website from somewhere else on the web is a vote, saying, this website's good. And what we'll do is look at the content of the page, and the content of the link to that page to understand the content. And quite simply, the more links you have, the more votes you've got, the higher up you'll be. Really straightforward. Now, it gets a little more complicated than that. A link from the Vinky.cz, I hope I said that right, apologies if I didn't, um, is going to be much more useful than a link from my blog. Because Novinky in itself is a much more important site. So by them saying, this site's interesting for this reason, it's actually telling me more than you know, me just writing that, oh, I stumbled across this site in my blog. But they are all useful. That's the key. Building the index. Now, this is it's a lot of text, don't worry. What you need to know is we look at individual pages. We don't look at the site as a whole. And what that means is if a word is not on a page, then it won't rank. It's really that simple. If your website is about cheap travel, or well, no, if your website's about travel, but you're a luxury brand and you know you sell very expensive holidays, you have to realize the most common search term when people are looking for travel is cheap flights or cheap holidays. And if you don't have the word cheap on your website, you're not going to turn up for that search term. It really is that simple. So you need to think about what terms users will enter and make sure that you rank accordingly. We also try and understand the web page as a human would find it useful. So we've tried to design our search algorithm to optimize content based on what's going to be useful for users, not what search engines are going to find interesting. 
Computers, you know, are very good at taking huge amounts of information and dissecting them, but we really want to make sure that there isn't information hidden, you know, you're not just loading the page with keywords, and that when a user hits the page, they're not just going to see, you know, cheap flights, cheap flights, cheap flights, cheap flights. They're actually going to see useful context that tells them about the sort of cheap flight they might be getting. So, what happens? This is kind of interesting. Every time you submit a query, we fan it out to lots of different machines. We break all this uh, information that we find up and shard it and store it on different machines. Um, we scan the index, we select the documents, rank the results and present them. And we do this every time in real time. We don't cache this information. And when you make a search, you'll see that it takes, you know, hopefully less than about 0.2 of a second. And we're sometimes scanning millions and millions of documents. Um, and so to do that, we have machines all over the world and we try to do it as quickly as we can. But we've also realized speed is very, very important. We've seen a real link between if, you know, the uh, speed of results gets slower, we get less searches done. People like it. Even by, you know, a quarter of a second, it can make a big difference. So there are actually, beyond just PageRank, beyond these links into your website, there are a lot more signals behind the scenes. 200 quality signals, in fact. And there are all sorts of things like keyword density, like where the links are coming from. You know, if you... Uh, PageRank is based on the number of links into a website. You'd think it would be very easy for you to create 100 websites, link them all to each other to build up PageRank, and then link them all to one website. That's called a link farm. It's something that's very easy to spot. But it's one of the things we look at. Do we see you know, these farms of traffic that are designed just to augment PageRank? So we would use all these signals, and I think of them like a big wall of dials somewhere in Mountain View. And every day, someone goes up and just turns a couple of them a little bit. And so we're always tweaking these quality signals to see what the best results will be. And that's why you'll see results move around a little bit, because we still don't believe we've got the best results for our users, and we're always working to improve them. Um, this is another one. Hard problem number two we've already touched on. 25% or up to 25% of the web <coughs> excuse me, has never been seen before. The other one is 25% of queries are new. Um, take, for example, iPod. Before the iPod came out, no one searched for the term. Then it arrives, suddenly everyone's searching for it because they want to find it cheaply. So we not only need to find new content, we also need to be constantly building new words into the index and understand which words are important. So when you're building content, um, what's good to know? First of all, can your page be found? This might sound really, really obvious, but there's actually a lot of advertisers, a lot of big companies that I speak to, will have their front page uh, as a country selection with a drop-down box. Now, Googlebot, our engine, our spider, which goes and crawls the web, doesn't fill in forms. It doesn't click buttons. It won't pretend to be a human that much. So if you're presenting the Googlebot with a country selection page and no static links, that's it. That's your site, as far as we're concerned. Again, it might sound obvious, but I've seen huge companies you know, come to us and go, why are we in the index? And you have a look at their website and go, well, this is why. We don't know what to do. So you need to think about little things like this. Once you've done that, can your URLs be indexed? Try and make them as simple as possible. We'll come on to some more tips around this um, in a bit, but make sure that you can actually click through to each point in your site pretty easily. Now, is the content useful? Have you got replicated content? Are you repeating the same thing multiple times in different places? That's not going to be useful to us or to users. They want to find content once, and they want to find it in a useful way. If you service the same content in 10 places, we don't know which one to present. We don't know which is the most important. We'll try and guess, but we might not always get it right. It's safer just to present us with stuff once. And then rank. How well do your pages rank? Have you got enough inbound links? There's something called Webmaster Guidelines, uh, which is available on Google. You'll be happy to know it's also available in Czech. Um, there's a little language drop-down at the top there. I don't lose anything, no. Um, and so if you search for Webmaster Guidelines, it's thankfully the first result. Um, and it's basically the top tips, um, what's good to do, how to design your site well. Fortunately, I've made a few slides, which hopefully explains it a little bit better. So what's the first thing to think about? Look at this URL at the top, stanford.edu home welcome campus index. You can read that, and you kind of know what you're going to get. You're going to get an, a welcome page to the campus. Um, a user may find this useful. If they're looking at a search result, the snippets, they'll see the URL underneath. If it's scary, and it looks like this, it's going to put them off. If it's easy and it looks like this, search slash Q equals Amsterdam, not everyone will understand that, but I'm pretty sure everyone in the room can at least guess that that's going to be a search for Amsterdam. So make it easy. Google will also extract keywords from that URL, so it's a way to reinforce the content of the page. 
uh, UTF-8 and Z equals 11 and IW lock equals ADR, ADDR. That doesn't mean much to Google. We're not going to look at those for keywords. Um, here, so you see. Uh, the other thing, make a site with a clear hierarchy and text links. So it's fine to have drop-down navigation, but as I said, we won't always follow that navigation. Um, it's better to have text links, even if you just put those at the bottom down here so that Google's able to follow them, and then have you know, your complex user-based uh, navigation at the top. That's going to be fine. Another mistake people make is they have the text links, but they're built with JavaScript or with Flash or something like that. Again, we don't do a great job of reading Flash or JavaScript a lot of the time. We'll try, but we can't promise. And so where you can, make sure that there's just a plain, old, simple text link to every page in your site as it says here. Redirect. Now, you might want to insert session information. You might have redirects based on cookies or preferences that people have set up when they come to the home page. That's fine. Redirects, you know, they're required part of most websites these days. But make sure you keep them to a minimum. Less than five is ideal. And if at all possible, try and make each one redirect as quickly as possible to the final link. If you've got, you know, if you've updated your site architecture and the home page used to go here and now it goes here and now it goes here and over the course of a few years you've ended up with six or seven redirects, it's not just us who are going to have a hard time, but also users are going to be clicking and they're just going to wait. I don't know if you guys use Facebook much, probably not, but they suffered from it for a little while where you'd log on and it would just, when you were logging on, it would be pushing you through multiple authentication servers. And it's just a bit boring to wait as a user. And in fact, we see it on the Google search results. If someone clicks on a result and they're waiting more than a few seconds for that page to load, they'll just hit back or stop and click the next result down. So it's not just us who are going to find it useful. It's going to be really beneficial for your users. It sounds really obvious, but again, something that people miss. Pages that are fast are pages that are do well. User queries. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again probably another 15 times in the presentation. I apologize, but it is the most important thing. The terms on the page are the ones that will return when they search. If they're not on the page, they won't return. Simple, but easy to forget. And also think, um, think about how users search. Most of you probably have a marketing manager somewhere. I know I do. And he says, we need these words on this page. And it's like, but why? No one's going to search for the most amazing flight from London to New York. They're going to search for cheap flight, London, New York. So those are the words we need. Title, heading, keywords. Um, hopefully, you're all pretty comfortable with the idea of title tags and h1, h2, h3 tags in a web page. Make them work together. The title of your page should sum up what it's about. You would not believe how many large companies have the same name on every single page of their website. This isn't just bad for Google because it doesn't tell us much about what's there, but when a user searches and all they see is Stanford University, they don't know necessarily that they're going to be getting to the right section. So by putting the information about what it is, I just covered it, but it's still on my hand, I've realized. It's kind of pointless. But um, you see what I mean? It's really, really good to provide this information. Remember, this is basically your call to action. This is what's going to decide whether or not someone clicks. So make this title something that's going to really engage people. And similarly with the heading, make it aligned to the title. If you want to break the content up into multiple sections, use headings to do it. Make the H1 the top heading. If you've got subsections, use H2 or H3, whatever works for you. But break it up in a sensible way. And finally, keywords. Are they relevant terms? I told you I was going to drill this home again and again. But do think about those keywords as you write them. There are a couple of seats up here at the front, guys, if you want to come and sit down. It's fine if you're happy at the back. I don't mind. Um, snippets. Now, these bits here. Um, there are a few ways to control these. What we'll try and do is extract text from the page that matches the user's query. So if they search for cheap flights and you've got cheap flights on the page, we'll put you know the best cheap flights available on the web because that's the text that's there. However, you can also use your meta tag, meta description tag. Now, we won't ever use that for keyword relevance. We won't extract information from it because we believe that the content of the page should reflect the content of the page. You shouldn't be able to just tell us this page is about. If it's not about that, then it's not about it. But if the meta description closely matches the user's query, we'll try and take that instead. A good example is a book site. Now, you might have a list of different pages with different books on that have a synopsis of the book and reviews from the users and a price and so on. And we get a match, and we don't necessarily know which part to display, and it might look a little bit fragmented. What you can do in the description tag is say, you know, it's uh, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Fire, ISBN number XYZ, price of this, author JK Rowling. 
and actually have a sort of structured look and feel to that. And that again is going to attract the user in because it's the key points, it's the information they're looking for. And it's not always going to show because the user's query won't always match, but when it does, it's going to be incredibly effective. Check your site using links. How many people have used links? One or two, probably the same guys who do SEO. Um, think about, uh, well, links is a text browser. Basically, this is what you'll see when you look at a page. It's not rendering images. It'll use the alt tags or, in some cases, the name of the uh, button or the image. Now, the name of the image isn't always that useful, especially when it's something like logo.jpg. That doesn't really tell us much about your company or your website. So do get descriptive names. Also use alt tags and title tags within the images to give us more information about them. And it doesn't have to be, I think I've jumped ahead of myself here. Yeah, images, we'll come back. Um, and it doesn't always have to be absolutely explicit, um, the content there. It can be, uh, you know, this, you don't have to put three people leaning over a table reading a book with the woman and her hand forward. You can put Stanford or Yale University, is it Yale or Stanford? Yale graduate students, you know, have great access to facilities, or the library at Yale's amazing, or whatever information it is you're trying to put. But obviously if it's a picture of a pig, don't put this as a dog, because that's just going to confuse people. Flash and JavaScript. So we've already touched on these, and I'll be coming back to Flash in more detail. Um, ultimately, if you can, provide a text version of the site. It's going to be good not only for Google, but also for people who have trouble dealing with rich elements like that. Typically the blind who have screen readers, or people who are vision impaired in other ways, or even these days, a lot of corporate environments might disable JavaScript. Um, and internet cafes also, you'll find that it doesn't work so well. So if you can make a simple version of the site available, you're definitely going to get a few more users, and people are going to like you for it and come back. Um, if you can't, if you really do have to have Flash, try to avoid using it for the whole page. At least break the navigation out. Hi. Just a simple yep. So the question was, what about duplicate content if you make Flash and no Flash? Um, fortunately for you, because we're not very good at crawling Flash, we can't tell it's duplicate. So we see the Flash movie, and then we see a text version of the site. And we may be able to extract small pieces of text from the Flash movie, um, but we're definitely going to be able to extract all the text um, from the text version. And in fact, what some people do now is they'll uh, prevent crawling of the Flash content, only provide crawling of the text, and then have a big banner at the top that says, this is the text version. We also have a much richer version. Click here to see it. Sure. So the, again, the question, if 95% of people have Flash and they see the text version on Google, but you want to send them to Flash, what do you do? We've well, got to remember that we probably, you know, depending on how you've put the Flash together, um, they might not be able to find it if it's just Flash. So they'll actually only be seeing the text version anyway. So that's why it's important on the text page to say, we do have a Flash version available. But honestly, the best thing is to act like YouTube and have just the kind of... Um, Flash elements on the page is Flash and have a lot of text around it to describe it. Really minimize the amount of Flash that's used to describe the information. I've got some examples coming up. Um, so, images we've done. One other thing, test and measure everything. This is something that a lot of people miss. Um, we spend a lot of time testing different things. And we've got two products called Website Optimizer and Google Analytics, both of which are free. There's a lot of other free analytics and optimization tools out there. I'm going to tell you about ours because I'm from Google and that's what we do. But you know, obviously you don't have to use these. The point is, um, using the website optimizer, you can nominate elements on your page. So say the headline and the image. And you can try different pieces of copy. So you can say, here are three different headlines I want and here are three different images I want. And then you define a conversion. You say, this is what the goal of this website is. And what we'll do, using JavaScript, um, is, remember, no script tags, um, we'll provide different versions of the page to different visitors and measure what percentage of each convert, and then provide you with an easy-to-read graph that shows you which combination was the most successful. And in fact, we tried this on the Picasso homepage. We had over 200 different combinations, and the winning combination drove 30% more downloads. Um, the interesting thing about analytics is, Google Analytics, it's not just AdWords it tracks. It will track all forms of incoming traffic, and you definitely want an analytics package that can do that. 
you need to know where your clicks are coming from. You need to know who's writing about you. You want to understand that, um, you know, which paid campaigns are working for you. I've seen people who set up Google Analytics only to find that Google AdWords was not working for them and Yahoo was working brilliantly. That's fine. We don't want people to waste money on things that don't work for them. We want them to understand what works for them. Google doesn't work for everyone, but you need to understand what works for you. So, hot topics. First of all, different results for different locations. This is what I get if I search for beer on google.co.uk. This is what I get if I search on uh, google.cz. Similar results, uh, a couple of Wikipedia results, some images at the top, but they're localized. Um, obviously, beer is an English word, so we're going to get slightly more English results. But you'll see that even based on location, we'll deliver different types of information. And language as well. Hotel is probably the worst example of this, because it's almost identical in every single language. But most other words have a local variation. That's why you know, we speak different languages, obviously. So simply based on the language, we can return you know, fairly interesting tailored results. But also location plays a major part too. Universal search um, is also a big feature, and it's becoming more and more abundant in search results. So when you do a search, you're not just seeing 10 web results. You're starting to see images and map results and news and books and video results blended right in. That's because we've got all these separate silos of information, um, but not everyone knows about them. And in fact, when you go searching for Porsche car, for example, you don't necessarily know that we've got, you know, we've got books on it. There's news that you know, the latest Porsche has been released or that there are images. You just do that web search, and then you'll click the results and hopefully get to what you want. By providing different types of results in the results page, people are led to these different types of information. And we find that uh, different results will trigger different types of um, included media. And it also learns over time. So if people aren't engaging with, say, the video results, they'll disappear. If they're not clicking on the news, they'll disappear. And that's really important. We want to make sure that the search results are relevant. We don't just want to force information on people if it's not useful to them. Flash, we've touched on. It can be great for high quality user experiences. You've all seen the Disney website. Uh, for Pirates of the Caribbean, or the Little Mermaid, or you know another, any other Flash site, which kind of it's got that big loading screen at the front. Um, the problem is, even if we can extract the text from Flash, we can't always send people to where they want to go. So Pirates of the Caribbean website, you search for Johnny Depp biography, it finds a Johnny Depp biography, and you click on the link, and we can't deep link you into a Flash site. We can only send you to the page we found it on. So you're going to get this loading, diddle diddle diddle, and then the music and the flashing things. And you're actually going to have to make quite an effort to find the information that you looked for. Even though we know it's in there, we can't send you straight to it. So again, it comes down to this idea of providing navigation. So it can be a rich user experience. Users really can engage with it. But screen readers and um, search engines have a really hard time dealing with it. So what do we recommend? Use HTML for navigation as a bare minimum. Use the description meta tag, if you can, provide a bit more information about the page. Use text tracks, or make a text-only version. So if you've got content saved in XML, for example, just have two different templates, one Flash, one HTML that uses the same data and just renders it appropriately. Here's an example. This is a video I found this morning, actually. I just went to cz.youtube.com. This is crazy. Honestly, go look at it. Search for F20. This is like this guy's model, uh, model plane, and it's a jet in the back. It's, it goes really quickly. We're all like gathered around it, amazed. Um, but that's obviously the bit that's flash on the page. These bits, well, in fact, the rest of the page is HTML. But these are the bits where we can really start to extract more information. In fact, I probably picked a really bad example, because it just says F20, and the same in the description, F20. And there are some comments here. But the point is, we can actually read this information very easily as a spider. The flash is there, the user is engaging with it, but the rich information around the flash is easily discoverable by search engines. And that's kind of the key. What else? Robots.txt. Uh, how many of you have heard of this? Probably easier to say how many haven't heard of this. Everyone's heard of it? Two or three. You're nervous to say. It's fine. I didn't know what it was. Um, so what it allows you to do is control how Google accesses your site. And not just Google, but any self-respecting search engine. The first thing it does when it hits your website, or the first thing it should do, is look for the robots.txt. And all the major search engines support this. Now, at its most simple, you can just say, disallow logs. Because you know, you're just storing logs on the website for whatever reason. Maybe you want easy access to your web stats, but you don't necessarily want Google to access them. Disallow logs, but allow logs introduction, because maybe that's the overview, maybe it's important. And you can restrict by user agent, too. 
So at Google, we use Googlebot. That's what the Googlebot comes in crawling. Microsoft, Yahoo, Ask, the other engines all have their own names. You can find them, good ringtone. You can find them on your website. You can find them on their website and um, restrict and control accordingly. You can also use uh, meta tags, sorry, here. Um, so you can say for one particular page, for example, don't index this or don't follow the links in it or do follow the links in it, perhaps, if you want it to override the robots information. So use robots.txt for general rules about directories, for example, and meta tags for page by page control. There are also some advanced controls. We support wildcards. So if you've got a bunch of PowerPoint files or doc files or something like that that you don't want crawled, you can disallow those too. And you can also match. I mean, maybe for whatever reason, every page that has 10 in the name shouldn't be crawled. So you can just say disallow star 10 star. Um, you can also control right down in detail, no snippet and no archive. So if you don't want us to display snippets for a page, perhaps it's often changing and you don't trust us to be crawling enough, or you don't want us to keep a cache of the page, again, because you want people to come to the site, you can control that too. We want to make sure that you guys are able to do whatever you like. Exactly. So, in fact, it's probably, I think there's one back here somewhere. Wow, miles back. Here we go. Yeah, so, sorry, I should have explained this. Title, URL, this is the snippets. Yeah. So these two lines of text. Now I'm going to have to go forward about 300 slides. Sorry. Exactly, the title and the URL. And some people want that. I don't really understand why, but they do, so we offer it. Duplicate content. Um, this was touched on a little bit earlier. It's entirely possible that you've got multiple copies of a page, even after you've made your best efforts. Um, for example, Swedish fish, delicious candy. Um, you could access it through product.php, item is Swedish fish. You might also see a category tag. Um, you might also see a tracking ID or a session ID in there. And these URLs are effectively all pointing to the same content. There's a few ways you can control that. You can use redirects. You can hide some of this information within the cookies uh, when a user's cruising the site. Um, you can have um, redirects so that no matter which one they come to, they're always redirected back to one version of the page. Or you can use robots.txt to prevent us crawling. But we'll try and do the best job we can in terms of clustering them together. If we find the same page with broadly the same URL, like this, on your website, we'll say, OK, so we've just found different ways to get the page. Let's make a guess at which one we think should be served, and we'll serve that one. And generally, what we'll do is try and avoid the one with something like session in it, because that's probably specific to the session, and try to aim for the one with the shortest URL. We can't always do that, but that's what we'll aim for. This is the other hot topic, paid links passing page rank. So I said that Google's search is based on uh, the number of links inbound to a web page. Lots of people will try to pay people to put, you know, not, art not advertising links or obviously advertising links, but just links that are kind of incidental on a page to artificially augment where their website should be. Most uh, search engines these days will use some form of page rank, some form of measuring inbound links to calculate this. And so paid links kind of distorts the view of the web on every major search engine. Um, and it makes it tough for us to understand where something is. So what we ask is that if you see other sites that have got higher than they should be through using paid link links, there's a form that you can use to report that in, in exactly the same way that you report spam that you find on the index. And we're not going to take people out of the index for this. All we're going to do is remove the value of those paid links so that they're actually appearing as they should. There's nothing wrong with paid links. They're a great source of traffic. Um, one of the best examples is startpagina.nl, which is a Dutch website. And it's one of the most common start pages in that country. And most of the links on that page are paid, but they don't pass page rank. And so when people start their web experience, they're presented with these links, and they know that if they want to go to a pharmacy, they've got three choices, and they click through. And the sites get a lot of traffic from those paid links. But the fact that those paid links exist, uh, or the fact that they're clearly marked as paid links, means we don't think that Start Pagina are artificially you know, suggesting or trying to tell us that those pages are worth more than they should be. So resources. Um, yeah, there are a lot of websites out there. Maybe 100 million, maybe more. Um, who really knows? The question, or the problem is, it would be really, really difficult for us to offer one-to-one -one support um, for all those website owners. Well, impossible, basically. Um, so what we've tried to do is create a scalable resource that you can log into 
um, and learn about and control what Googlebot's doing on your website. So uh, I don't know how that slide got in there, sorry. This is Webmaster Central, and you can access it at google.cz slash webmasters, um, and it looks like that. Slightly different to the English version, I'm sorry, but still broadly the same links. And these are the sorts of questions it can answer. How can I improve my site's visibility? What does Googlebot see? How often does it come crawling? What errors have I found? Where's my traffic coming from? Are all my pages indexed? And we'll have a look at some of these reports rather than just read you bullet points off a list. This is free. That's probably the most important thing to mention. You don't have to pay for this. Um, and at its most simple, you log in, you verify your site. There's some more details coming about this in a minute. Um, but on the front page, you'll see any errors that we had crawling. Maybe the page returned a 403 or a 404. Maybe we couldn't find it. Maybe we couldn't follow URLs for whatever reason. It lets you diagnose issues that you didn't necessarily know you had. So rather than having to sit down and write a script in Perl that spiders your own site or PHP or whatever, and spiders your own site and looks for errors, you can just use our technology, which is already doing that. We're really, really happy for you to kind of take advantage of that. The dashboard will provide an overview of your account. So when you go to google.com slash sitemaps or slash webmasters and click on the link, you punch in your website here. Um, and then you verify it. Um, and you'll also see if you've uploaded sitemaps errors. We'll come to sitemaps in a little bit. Here's the verification process. You can either choose a meta tag or you upload a file with a very specific name. And all you're doing is basically proving that you have write permission to that website. You can create some content on there and you own it. And once you've proved that you own it, we'll release the statistics to you. Obviously, we don't want to release the statistics to just anyone. We don't want your competitor to come along and see exactly how you're doing in the index. Once you've verified your site, we'll give you message center alerts if there are problems. Maybe we found malware. Maybe part of your site's excluded. And we'll give you an index summary, as I've touched on. You'll get errors and failings. This is for uh, Google.com, and you'll be happy to see that Google's breaching Google's quality guidelines, at least in one section. Um, you can click on the URL errors and you'll get information about the errors that we found, the type of error it was, and the date on which it was found. So we do want to give you detailed insight into why we perhaps haven't been able to access part of your site. Um, you'll be able to see mobile crawl errors. You'll be able to see issues with basically any type of content that you have. We'll try and deliver that to you. Now, this, top search queries. This is probably the most important, or well, not necessarily important, but interesting part. Clicked queries here. This is information that you can find out by running analytics on your site. You may not have an exact idea of volume, uh, but you'll definitely be able to access information like this with decent tools. We'll provide it anyway. This is what you can't really access anywhere else. And this is um, the average position of terms which aren't necessarily clicked on. They're ordered by volume too, it's important to remember. So, if you have the word Britney Spears on your site and you could rank in the top 10, chances are that term will be at the top, even if it never gets clicked, just because Britney Spears is so searched for. Um, but, or Paris Hilton these days, I guess. But we'll also show you the average position it appeared at, and that can be quite interesting. Um, and also, when it's clicked, we'll show you the average position it was at when it was clicked. And quite often, these won't necessarily tally. So you may find that you know the average position something will appear at is maybe number 10, um, but the average it's clicked at, I picked a bad example, but the average it clicked at may be higher because people are prone to clicking higher. You can also see terms that you rank for but don't necessarily get clicks for. And you can go and have a look at the title of your page and the snippets and perhaps understand why. Maybe the title of the page just doesn't engage with users. Maybe it's totally unrelated to the query. So it can help you diagnose really simple issues um, which can actually drive a huge amount more traffic. Um, you can break it down too by region and type of search. So for any of the search properties that you appear on, from product search to well, mobile search, image search, and so on, through to any of the domains, google.co.uk.com.cz, and so on, um, you'll be able to cross-reference all that information and understand that, you know, in general, maybe you're top for one term, but when you look really specifically at product search in the UK, um, you've got all these other terms that appear. And so you can really start to measure and optimize your site accordingly, based on where traffic comes and how it's delivered. This part's kind of interesting too. Links to your site, inbound links to your site, will show you the types of keywords that people use to link to your site. Um, so these we'll also use for keyword relevance. If we come to a page and there are just images on it and we can't extract any useful information, but for some reason that's had a lot of inbound links, um, then we'll be able to use the inbound link keywords to learn more about the page. 
You guys may have heard of this as uh, Google bombing, which we've sort of managed to quell now, but I guess the classic example is searching for miserable failure and coming up with George Bush's CV. Did you all see that? A whole bunch of bloggers basically linked to his CV with the words miserable failure. And back when we just took it at face value, suddenly we saw all these links inbound and he became the top result. In fact, if you search for click here, well, who knows what the top result for click here might be? Click here. You know, click here. Sorry? Yeah, exactly, Adobe Acrobat, because everyone goes to download Adobe Acrobat, click here. Um, so that's a real kind of demonstration of the power of that. Um, the page rank distribution amongst your site. This is the kind of uh, distribution you're going to see for most sites. Uh, not very many high, a few more medium, mostly low. And that's really common. Generally, your home page and a few of the more uh, important pages on your site will have the most inbound links, and so they'll have the highest page rank. And the links will kind of slow down. Um, towards the bottom of the site. Um, you'll also get access to some uh, search operators. Site colon followed by your site will tell you how many pages you have in the index. Um, now, if it's more than 10, uh, you probably don't want to be sitting there clicking next to see if we've actually indexed a page. So we have the info command as well. And you can put info followed by a specific URL. It doesn't just have to be the domain. And you can find out whether or not we have that page in your index. And these are actually uh, right in the Webmaster Tools. So once you've verified, you can get back to these very, very easily. And there's also link. So link colon followed by your site will show you the number of links inbound. The problem with that tool is for Google search results, we tend to favor speed over accuracy. So if you type in link colon something, we'll try and get you a quick result. We may not necessarily be able to drill all the way into the index, and the number may not be perfect. So we added a links tab um, into sitemaps into the webmaster tools which allow you to see pages with external and internal links and what you can do is click on one of these and it will actually just list all of the pages that we found and it'll take a little longer but it allows you because you own the site because this information is important to you it allows you to get access to this information and see it really easily and you can download a csv if that's what you want to do too and kind of analyze it you know stick it into a database and do complex manipulations and there's a website called SEOmoz as well that recently deployed a link database or a link catalyst database or something like that. And they've basically gone around and indexed all the pages on the web, but they haven't looked at the content, they've just looked at the links. And they're selling access to that now. So if you're kind of the way that your links are sculpted or interesting to you, that's something that's definitely worth checking out too. Um, there's also uh, the um, how many people know iGoogle? A few? Okay, good. Most of you. Yeah, we're doing okay. Um, you can download uh, very easily, or there's a button right in the Webmaster Tools that allows you to deploy gadgets to your iGoogle page. It creates a tab and just gives you 10 gadgets to give you a quick overview of your site. And if you've got multiple sites, um, you can just change them in the drop down here. Um, so rather than having to log into Webmaster Tools every day, you can just have it on your iGoogle and keep half an eye on what's going on. It's quite a nice kind of snapshot of, what's, of your site health. Now, we talked about making sure that, um, oh no, sorry, this is site links. Site links are what happens when you search for a page on the web, and you'll see these links underneath. So Chrysler is probably a good example, or in fact, I think Playboy has them too. And it's based on navigation um, on the web, on your website, combined with user searches. So if we see you've got eight sections on your website, and those are common search terms that are entered in conjunction with your website, then we'll start to create shortcuts for people who just type in your brand name, for example, or just your website name. And it allows people, rather than having to refine the search, to be able to click straight through to important places on your site and get to where they're going more quickly. It saves us CPU bandwidth because we're not having to do so many searches, and it gets people to see your site quicker. It saves them potentially seeing other results. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone. Now, from time to time, we may pick site links which aren't appropriate. Um, there was a classified site in the UK which had a very, very uh, strong adult section, but they didn't necessarily want people to know that, and one of their top site links was you know, adult content. So um, they were able to log in to uh, the Webmaster Tools and simply disable that site link. What you can't do is choose to add them. What you can do is switch off the ones that aren't desirable. So it's about giving you control. Um, Re-inclusion requests, spam report, paid link reports. So I touched on this earlier with paid links and spam. But essentially, if you find spam on the index, if you find paid links, if we've excluded some content uh, from your website, you can let us know. Um, we've got forms which, if you submit them from a verified account, and will generally get processed a bit quicker because we know that they're from you and not just someone pretending to 
like your competitor saying, this site's really spammy, take it out. If we know that uh, you're logging in and saying, you know, we found some paid links and it's this, then because you're happy to identify yourself, chances are you're telling us the truth and you're not just trying to uh, get someone out. Um, we'll also let you uh, test your robots.txt file. So you've created your robots.txt, you think it works, but you just want to make sure. You can paste it into here, this box, uh, and then there's another box down here where you can paste URLs, and then you can test it against different agents, hit check, and it'll tell you whether or not each of those URLs would be served. Um, there was a big, uh, uh, big job site in the UK uh, who deployed a robots.txt without testing it first and removed all their content from the index. Um, they weren't very happy, obviously, because suddenly they woke up one morning and they were getting no traffic from us. Um, they, you know, emailed us screaming, what have you done, what have you done? And we kind of emailed them back a link to their robots.txt and they fixed it pretty quickly. But this tool should be used before you make any changes to your robots.txt just to make sure you don't make the same mistake. It's really easy to do. Um, crawl rate. Now, I talked about this earlier too. We come and crawl your website. Um, we crawl it as often as we can. Depending on your page rank, we'll crawl it more or less frequently. My blog, for example, I have two readers, me and my mother, and that's true. Um, and so Google probably crawls it once a month because it's really not an important site. Um, whereas the BBC or CNN or a large or eBay, large sites like that, we need to be crawling every day and sometimes even multiple times a day because they've got lots of changing content that's important to lots of people. These graphs here will let you see how often we're crawling. So the number of pages crawled per day, the amount of kilobytes downloaded per day. Maybe you've done a redesign and you've really heavily loaded your pages and suddenly we're dragging too much traffic from you. And also the average spy, uh, time spent downloading a page. Now these two will just kind of indicate to you how often we're crawling and you can uh, adjust the rate at which we crawl with uh, some buttons on that page. If we're kicking you too hard, you can slow us down. If we're coming in too slowly and we think we can do a better job coming in more, more frequently, you can go faster and enable that. Um, this time spent downloading page, uh, this can be really useful just for a health check on your website. Uh, it's in milliseconds, so 1,000 milliseconds equals one second. If it goes above about 2,500, you're starting to get into the point where people are going to have a hard time clicking uh, or a hard time waiting for it to load and maybe starting to think about clicking back. Also, if you just see that um, you know, it's been served completely normally for ages in a spike here or even an upward trend over time, it may indicate that there are problems uh, that need to be solved. The upward spike may be you just had a lot of traffic one day or it may be that the server had a problem. Once you're starting to see an upward trend, it may be that your server is starting to grind under the pressure of additional traffic or you've got code that could be optimized. Um, so it can be really good to keep half an eye on that and just make sure it's not going too high. Geographic information. Now, this is an interesting one too. Um, Americans love uh, to think that they're the center of the world. This is being videoed, so I'm going to get shot when I get back to Google and this goes on YouTube. But they do, it's true. They don't realize that in Europe, you know, you might have English content hosted on a Swedish IP, um, also, you know, and then French content for the same site hosted on a German IP. And traditionally what they did was look at the uh, domain of a server to determine what it was, but if it was a .com, they'd look at the IP address, and that's as far as they went. And it meant that those people who had language content on .com domains in countries that weren't the language they were from, if that makes sense, we'd often get it wrong. So we added this tool which allows you to say, my website lives here, or in fact my section, my directory of this website lives here. Um, because you can register a subdirectory in Webmaster Tools, just like you can a site. So you can say, right, this is my French translation of the site, this is my English translation of the site, this is my German translation, bang, bang, bang. Set those up, and irrespective of where they're hosted and what domain extension they've got, we'll try and do a good job at serving them appropriately. We can't guarantee it, but we'll definitely try. Preferred domain. You might be serving content on example.com and www.example.com. This just lets you tell us which you'd like to see that on. Pretty straightforward. Enhanced image search. Now, uh, we talked about images earlier and how you don't necessarily have to be explicit with the content of the images. Um, you can talk about what they're about. But there's actually something called the Google Image Labeler. Has anyone heard of that? A few guys at the front and one at the back. Okay. Um, this is a tool which lets you... Uh, well, basically, it pits two people on the internet who don't know each other, it presents them with the same image, and then gets them to type in descriptions of that image. And when they type in the same description, it then says, got it, and moves to the next one. And the more complex the description, the more points you get. 
and there's a high score table and that's really the kicker it's this high score table that keeps people coming back and back and back to this so we have we see a spike kind of when school finishes i think it's mostly kids um, who are playing with it but they sit there and they try and beat their high scores every day and it's just it's really good fun but the point is it's also teaching us a lot about what's contained in images because these guys are out there describing images and we're able to add that information to the meta information in the images and then return better results in image search if you want your images included in that game if you want them to be described a little better just go in tick that box We'll take care of the rest. Now, sometimes you've put content up on the web that you didn't mean to. Sometimes you've just, you know, you've uh, maybe moved old parts of the site and or moved the site around, and you just want to make sure that content's removed. Um, sometimes you may have written a news article and now you're being sued and you've got to get it off quickly. Um, that happens quite a lot too. Um, what you can do here is uh, have removal requests. So what you need to do is update your robots.txt file or the meta tag on the web page come here, tell us about the web page, hit submit, and in three to five business days, often sooner, but we say three to five, it'll be gone, it'll be out of the index. So you can quickly remove that content and make sure it's not going to be troublesome anymore. Sitemaps. This is kind of the last piece of the cake. Um, islands of links. Um, imagine you've got a home page. Imagine that you've got, you know, products at the top and about us and contact us, and they're your three main sections. And for years, that works fine for you. And then you build a couple of microsites. And you link to those off your home page for a little bit because they're new. And then you, you know, your home page updates and they're not linked anymore. As far as we're concerned, they're a separate site. And we have to assume that. Because think about GeoCities or any other large hosting company that provides uh, websites on a subdirectory or with a tilde username. We can't assume that they're all one website. If they're not linked to each other, they're independent. Um, so you need to make sure that your website is linked together and we understand that it should be linked together and that the page rank is flowing nicely between it. It can be tough to do. Um, it might just be or a large site. You know, you've got a billion pages on your website or even 100,000 or even 10,000 or sometimes even 1,000. 100. Um, you want to make sure that we know about all these links. So what you can do is create a sitemap file. Um, this is supported by Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Ask, and there's a website called, I think, uh, there, sitemaps.org. Um, it's not available in Czech, but it's also not very complicated. So essentially, you provide a file, um, and it can either be a simple list of URLs, uh, one on each line, or it can be more complicated. Um, you can have additional information put into that file, and you can tell us about the priority of a page. You can tell us about the uh, frequency change date. You can tell us when it was last modified. And what we promise to do is, before we go crawling your site, we'll pull that sitemap file, the same as we pull a robots.txt file, and add that to our list of pages to crawl. It doesn't replace the existing crawl system, um, it just augments it. And it means that if there are pages out there that we were having trouble finding, if there are sections of your site which you didn't know weren't linked, we'll make sure they're all merged together, and we'll understand that that's all part of your site. We won't promise to put any in the index. If you, you know, just give us 100,000 pages, which are just a heading, we're not necessarily going to select them. But um, it will definitely help us discover content that we didn't necessarily know about before. Additionally, you'll get uh, information, uh, additional information about errors we may have found when crawling your site. So perhaps there are 404s, perhaps there are 503s, perhaps there are other types of errors that prevented us crawling this content. This is going to give you access to that. And you can get them for mobile too, which is becoming more and more of an issue as people build mobile websites. You want to make sure that your mobile content is represented in the mobile index, your web content's represented in the web index, feed us a sitemap, solves the problem. So how do you do it? You can either create a sitemap with the sitemap generator, or most content uh, management systems will be able to spit out a list of URLs, or you can write a few lines of code that will crawl your website, or you might have information in a database. I mean, you guys are hopefully, some of you are technical, so there are lots of different ways um, that you can generate this information. Um, then upload the file to your website, uh, reference it in the URL, that's it, all done. So, what have we learned? Build content for users, not search engines. That's absolutely key. The moment you start trying to build content to optimize for search engines, you're de-optimizing the user experience, and you're working against what Google are trying to do. So you can be pretty sure that the content you get won't perform as well as something that would work as well for a user. Test and measure everything. I can't underline this enough. We haven't found the best design for a web search results page. We're testing, well, last year we deployed 220 changes to the Google search page. Most of them stuff that people wouldn't notice. But 
each one of them noticeably improved the performance and the experience that users had. And that's absolutely the key. We're always testing this stuff. You should be too. Sign up for Webmaster Tools. Um, control the way we're accessing your site. Describe all the content on your site effectively. This is the last time you'll hear this from me, I promise, unless there are questions about it. Um, use keywords that people would search for, not ones that you think are good marketing speak. Give us a sitemap if we're having a hard time crawling your page, and visit google.cz webmasters. <laughs>